You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Brian Callen slash Hunter Mott Show. Um, Our guest is Professor Nick Bostrom. He's written a book called uh, Superintelligence. He is a professor of philosophy at Oxford University. And in 2009 and in 2015, he was included in Foreign Policy's Top 100 Global Thinkers. He'd never tell you that, though, because he's Swedish, and (laughs) the Swedes are very, very modest um, uh, when talking about themselves and all things Sweden. And I really enjoyed... The book was unique right at the start because you open in your introduction saying, look, I may very well be off the mark here um, in my entire argument, but... Having said that, your book has taken people like uh, Elon Musk and Bill Gates over to your side, and your side is suggesting that artificial intelligence and super machines could very well be the end of you know human beings as we know it, or at least they won't have any respect for their biological heritage, and you draw comparisons. Uh, to how we treat animals. So I'm looking forward to getting into this very deep conversation about the future with you, Professor. Um, well, so thanks, there it is. For, uh, thanks for inviting me. Of course. Um, what are the, 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 the thing that struck me, and, and it's interesting that you're a professor of philosophy, because I thought to myself, there's no way to write this book without first thinking very deeply about what it means to be human. You know, so much of what I hear when I hear atheists talk or when I hear, you know, people who are scientists is they they tend to try to reduce the human condition down to an algorithm. And do you think that's a fair criticism or critique of that side of of the of the arena and, and, you know, in, in the thinking arena? Well, I think a lot of people uh, simplify. Uh, It's kind of unavoidable. Yeah, especially if one is trying to think about very complex issues. Right, and I don't think you do that, by the way. I'm just saying that that. Oh, I am too. Like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you admit? Oh, I, I didn't. I thought you did a good job of. But there's there's you know. this real techno utopian strain that we hear from Ray Kurzweil that like AI is going to come along and everything's going to be amazing, and you're saying that's not necessarily true. Right. Yeah, we don't uh, know that. That's going to be the case. Um, so a lot of the, um, I mean, a lot of the pages in the book are about possible risks from machine superintelligence. Um, I should stress, though, that I also think that there is an enormous upside mm. that AI could be used to do an immense amount of good, and I'm really excited about that as well. Uh, it just seemed more pressing when I was writing the book to try to get a detailed understanding of exactly what could go wrong and how, so that we can make sure to avoid that. Whereas it seemed to me that we could maybe get by with a more general vague sense uh, for the exciting opportunities. And then we can, if, if we avoid all the pitfalls, we will eventually like, have a lot of time uh, to work out exactly how we want to use all the wonderful opportunities. But um, I think that it might be uh, like t- good to try to correct that impression that some readers might come away with, that I'm actually more of a downer than I am when it comes to the future of AI. No, but you're saying if you're going to bring the owl into, uh, into the sparrow's colony, we better know a lot about how to tame an owl. I, mean, I love that. Yeah, that, that, that seems like a, a good thing to do, develop would you, the owl taming technology. Yeah, before, would, you, would you mind telling that story just for our listeners, the, the story of the owl and the sparrows? Well, you pretty much already uh, reached the, um, yeah. the punchline there. But yeah, so it's a little allegory that I start off the book with, where one arrow has the bright idea that it would be really convenient to have an owl working for the colony who uh, could keep an eye out for the neighborhood's cat, you know, help them with various chores. And they all get really excited and set off on a quest to find maybe an abandoned owl egg or an owl chick or perhaps a baby weasel or some other animal might also do. But there is this one sparrow who is not convinced, Skronkfinkel. 
uh, <laughs> and and he he tries to voice some obvious objections to this scheme, but he's overall the other ar- sparrows are already off, um, you know, looking for the owl egg, and so uh, Skongfikul is left with a couple of colleagues to 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 try to do the their best work they can of, of figuring out how, how what what you would actually do if this this owl. Yeah, and, and and of course the risk is the owl could turn around and eat all the sparrows. But but, but here's my here's a, always been my argument, <clears throat> always as if I've been thinking about this forever. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> but I do think that that here here is something that I think is not addressed enough in when people talk about AI and the idea that machines will start building better versions of themselves and so then be more concerned about their survival and procreation. And if humans are deemed a threat they'll get rid of humans or use human beings as we do animals for tools, etc. There are a lot of uh, doomsday scenarios. Oh. My, my, my issue, though, is this. Human beings, <clears throat> and the fundamental difference is that human beings know there's an end. Human beings know we, we are going to die. And human beings have always looked you know, for immortality. And we've always been looking for the fountain of youth. You've got Kurzweilists, guys like Ray Kurzweil say, hey, we're going to be able to download uh, your brain into a computer and you'll live forever. And I think the conceit there is the idea that you think you, no, I'm not talking about you, but I'm saying someone like Ray Kurzweil actually thinks you you can you can ultimately figure out what it means to be a human being in all its mystery. Uh, human beings are driven by the fact that they know they're going to die. How in the world could you program grief into a machine? Uh, we use animals, yes, uh, but remember... Animals were such an existential threat. Microbes, bacteria, birds, rodents that ate our crops, mountain lions and wolves that killed our livestock, coyotes that killed our chickens. It goes on and on. Uh, Grubs that killed our potatoes. So there was a constant battle just to feed our families and survive against nature. Forget just the wind and the rain and all that stuff. So I, I don't know that computers, number one, will ever feel like they're going to die because they're not and also why would we think that a computer would even find a human being these super machines why would they even find a human being not only a threat but even useful so that that well yeah no i mean there's a lot of things there maybe we can take a few of them so i don't think that they would find human beings useful in the longer term Hmm. i think the model is more something like we want to build a parking lot somewhere there happens to be an ant colony there, so maybe they get paved over or destroyed. Uh, but it's not because we hate the ants or have any resentment to them. It's just because uh, they're in the way. They weren't factoring into our uh, uh, objective function. Mm. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, in other words, rather than um, it, uh, rather than there being sort of a, a, a specific and uh, sort of animosity toward human beings that will just be in the way or not even a factor in in their multiplication or in their right it's, if 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 we are if we don't do our jobs properly in, in terms of developing this kind of ai controlled technology and safety um research that we need then you, they they could end up with a utility function a preference function that would not place value on our well-being or our existence in which case we would just be uh, objects in the world that you need to take into account in the short run to maybe prevent some human from switching off. But once you are powerful enough, then it would be irrelevant. But why would why would machines? We know why human beings want to procreate and want to live forever because we're very aware that we are this biological machine that I'm living in is going to it is withering and it's going to deteriorate and finally turn to dust in the end that is not a concern for a machine it never will be really or 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 will it and and why do I mean, we, why would we machi- think that machines can would- die like i mean i had a laptop that died uh, <laughs> ignominiously not too long ago for that uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, so, so suppose you take some, to illustrate this, let, let, let's make it more concrete. Let's suppose you have an AI with some goal. Let's say the goal to make as many paper clips as possible. Mm. Maybe we designed this to run a paper clip factory and then it became super intelligent, but it still has this goal to maximize the number of paper clips. Now, this AI 
will have an instrumental reason to care about its own survival because it can predict that if it is still around in the future, it will at that point in the future be trying to make paper clips and probably there will be more paper clips in the world than if it is destroyed. And so even though it doesn't care about survival for its own sake, it's useful as a means to achieving more paper clips. And so now, instead of the goal of paper clips, you could plug in most other conceivable goals you might imagine, and they will tend to have these instrumental sub goals of um, survival, of accumulating more resources, I of see. becoming more intelligent. Mm. That's interesting. And so that's the concern that, that, that there are these convergent instrumental reasons. Uh, to achieve various states in the world that might not be consistent with the survival of human civilization. Well, and, and fundamentally, I mean, it's all a competition for resources, right? I mean, <clears throat> you know, you talk a lot of in the book about, you know, them essentially breaking out into space. But obviously, in order for them to be able to do that, they first need to make the most of the resources on the planet Earth. And there, there is inevitably going to be a competition for resources, just as there is a competition between ants and humans for that parking lot space. There's going to be a competition between humans and AIs for the resources of the planet. Right, unless you have a very, very special kind of goal, like if the AI's goal actually, let us say, is the same as ours, then it would obviously fail to achieve its goal if it killed us or mm, harmed us, because we don't want that. So if, if you have an AI that's essentially on your side, then this problem is obviated. But thinking about it from a biological perspective, you can't assume that there's not going to be some sort of mutation at some point. Even if you initially start out and program in that goal of, you know, that is aligned with human happiness, right? You talk about, you know, hedonium and all of this stuff. But even if you start off with that inevitably, isn't it going to reach a point where there will be some sort of mutation or variant that drops that out as non-essential? I don't think necessarily. Like once you have a sufficiently high level of technological capability, it should be possible in particular to prevent goal system corruption. That is, if you want to make a copy of a piece of software, even today, you usually succeed in making a flawless copy. And you can use error correcting code, you can do multiple proofreads, and you can do various things that will kind of arbitrarily reduce the probability of a mutation in the copy. What, and I, an AI would recognize the essential importance of doing that if it were spawning copies of itself. Um, if the overall achievement of its goal was uh, on the line here, it might take great precautions to, to prevent errors from slipping in. But in order to have super intelligence, I mean, that was the other big thing is, you know, what is human intelligence? And that was that was one of the conversations that Brian and I had before the show, because we've had a lot of people on the show like, you know, Joseph Henrik. Um, who, you know, the, the, the real sort of insight, right? A lot of, a lot of the sort of the versions of AI that you're describing are very much sort of an enlightenment version of in human intelligence where you're going to have this hyper-rational individual, um, this one super genius. Um, and the, the, the model that has sort of emerged out of biology is that individuals are not particularly smart, um, but that what happens is that you have this hive mind emer that emerges and what the real intelligence of humans is the ability to acquire culture over time and to have those cultures mutate and change until you end up with sophisticated cultural packages that are passed on. And if that's the case, then I think that in order to have a truly intelligent machine, you have to allow for evolution and you have to allow for mutation. And as soon as you allow for mutation, then you can no longer control the direction that it takes. Yeah, I think that the evolution and mutation is a separate thing. I mean, it might be useful to have an architecture that has many different components, um, in a sense like humanity has many different individuals. You could have an AI that has many different modules within itself, if that, if that were an efficient way to process the information. It, it doesn't mean, though, that in terms of the... Um, um, final goal that it was pursuing, that it would want to um, risk any uh, corruption or deviation from that. Um, you, you could have a great multiplicity of different parts doing the thinking and analysis, trying out different ideas, soaking up different perspectives without having the goal module itself. But see, it'd be very so, difficult to have a machine comprehend what we don't comprehend ourselves. So in other words, I was thinking about this. Uh, I was laughing with, with – uh, my friend was looking at this woman. 
and we she was a makeup artist and she was very overweight and he likes women that are in really good shape and he i said what are you doing he said i don't know what it is man i'm attracted to that girl and i'm attracted to her in a dirty way and he went through some very dirty uh it, fantasies uh you know and they were kind of like and i looked at him he goes i know i know i don't get it and he walked away and i thought to myself yes well we've all had emotions we have no we can't understand we can't explain you can't explain to me why you know there's so many things why i feel uh incredibly sad uh, and yet joyous when I listen to a great piece of music. My friend's 87 years old, and he was, had a birthday party, and he was singing, and his voice is failing him. He's this wonderful old man who was a great singer back in the day, but he's 87. His body's breaking down, and uh, a woman was watching him, and she was crying, and she didn't even know him, but she was crying because it was so kind of glorious that this guy at 87 still wasn't giving up. There are these things about human beings that are such a mystery and we still can't figure out really what turns somebody off, what turns somebody on. Why does somebody get turned on when they get turned off? I hate that I'm attracted to that person. He's a scumbag. You know, you'll hear a woman say, he's disgusting, yet I want to have sex with him. There are these so many of these sort of and I know you as a philosopher, probably this is no mystery to you. You probably think about this a lot. But could you talk a little bit about that and whether or not that's even a factor in your fears about AI? I'm sorry. Did, I'm, I'm sorry. That was well, a lot of examples. Yeah, what I mean I'm is the, to think about the, where, where the endless I mean, mystery of human beings. There's a lot of say. things that we do understand about, say, um, human sexual desire. Like it's, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, not random. Mm that majority of adults um, find the opposite sex attractive of childbearing age rather than, say, insects or trees or <laughs> plants or something like that. Out of all the possible objects, there is like obviously a strong bias. Speak for yourself. The particularly anyway, yeah. object that is, uh, yeah. would have been reproductively relevant in the ancestral context. I see. Um, but, um, I mean, it's also the case that there are... Uh, even with the AI we have today, cases where they might have intuitions and make judgments that we don't precisely understand. AlphaGo was this uh, game AI that defeated the human champion Lee Sedol just recently in, in the game of Go. And AlphaGo has a kind of visual intuition. It can look at the Go board and figure out where is a promising looking place to place the next stone. Let's explore that further. Um, something quite analogous, I think, to human intuition. And it's, it's not obvious exactly. I mean, we know the under, underlying algorithms that, that, that drive AlphaGo, but isn't that case. But isn't that pattern recognition, Professor? Isn't that just a higher level of pattern recognition, kind of like chess? Yeah, is? but I mean, who knows whether or not that might also have been the case with your friend. In this episode that you told us, um, maybe there was some pattern <clears throat> that uh, that stimulated his desire for. I think you mean a psychological trigger or whatever it might be. It right? could have been like uh, maybe some fertility clues or maybe some uh, recollection of some other earlier experiences he has had. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. pattern recognition certainly was a part of it. I'd imagine. What about grief? What about it? Well, what about grief and, and how would a machine ever, how can you even conceive of a machine ever feeling grief? Um, uh, would you necessarily want the machine to feel grief? Well, but uh, I, think, I think that's, the, that's the sort of the big, the big dividing line that we're dealing with here is, is that, you know, there's this idea of intelligence that a lot of this AI is talking about, which essentially denigrates social intelligence. And what a lot of the biology is saying is that the whole basis of human success and the reason why we've been able to distance ourselves from the apes is because we have social intelligence. I mean, you know, when you do an IQ test on a chimp, an orangutan, and a human toddler, when you get into spatial reasoning or when you get into, you know, sort of causal reasoning, there's no difference between the chimp, the orangutan, and the toddler. The way that the area in which the toddler stands out is social intelligence. So, I mean, I think that's what's interesting is, is that, you know, God supposedly created man in his own image, and Silicon Valley is really trying to create AI in its own image, which is to be, you know, hyper-value rational intelligence and to have a very low role for social intelligence. But I think that fundamentally misreads, you know, the story of human evolutionary success. 
And so grief is essential, right? You need loyalty. You need all of these sorts of things. It's be- what drives us. It's the, the running away from pain and toward pleasure, or at least trying to stay alive for as long, which I still haven't seen. So, Professor, I guess what we're asking is that has to have that has to play a factor into the the notion that we want to always stay alive and we get rid of anything that is a threat to that. Uh, so we try to keep grief away from us. And if that means we have to kill somebody, uh, i.e. terrorists or whatever it is, we do that. I don't know if uh, – do you – I guess the argument I'm making is I find it difficult to see w- if if a machine doesn't have grief, why it would care either way. And I get, you know, maybe you said maybe you said it's the the mission. I think you kind of answered that before, but maybe we could extrapolate a little bit more on that. Yeah, well, let's let's think about this social intelligence <clears throat> point. I think it's um, kind of necessary for humans to have social intelligence because our brain is chopped up into small little pieces, each piece within one skull. So humanity's total brain mass is divided over seven billion people, and the only way. Um, that we can achieve something significant is by trying to connect those little brain pieces together by talking and writing and so forth. Mm. But if you could have all of those brain pieces just in in one big brain ball to begin with, then that might be much more efficient than kind of going through language, which, you know, seems impressive to us, but it's a lot lower bandwidth than, say, the bandwidth between your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere. But it also, um, I think that's the that's sort of where the you know where the the science of human intelligence is starting to deviate from the sort of the enlightenment idea is is that actually because you talk in the book about satisficing, and you know part of what emerges from all this evolutionary biology is that you could continue to make the human brain bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but you don't necessarily get better returns. You get better returns by having more individuals who aren't necessarily super intelligent, but who have the idea who have the ability to, you know, have different ideas that combine, recombine, compete, they fight, they die, they do all of that sort of stuff. And then, you know, over time, what we've seen is greater cooperation. That's what the last 10,000 years have really been about. So that, you know, rather so that we find more and more effective ways to communicate those ideas. But I don't, I, I, I just, I think that's the, that's that for me, that's the big question about AI is, does AI end up being, you know, this sort of, one massive collected seven billion brains all together in one blob, or is it? Does it end up looking remarkably like us in the sense that there are? It has to have these emotions, and it has to have these feelings, and it has to have this social intelligence so that it can, you know, fight for different. Because there presumably there will be different visions of how do you achieve that goal. Even if it is the paperclip thing, you're going to have different visions of how do you achieve that, and you're going to have rival factions that compete and try and show the merit of their strategy. Professor, <laughs> well, I think I, I mean I do. I do have a long chapter on multipolar outcomes, where you have not just one big Uber intelligence, but a lot of different ones that compete. I think that's a real possibility, but I don't think it would be because of the reasons you say. I think it would be because of coordination failures that you just have competing entities developing their own AIs. Uh, I mean, there is a general principle, which is that if you have a lot of serial computing power, you can always use that to simulate a lot of different, you could do time sharing. So you could use your fast serial processor to uh, simulate a parallel system, whereas it's not always easy to take a parallel system and simulate the serial system. Um, So if you had one big, really big blob, and for some reason it was useful to have a lot of smaller modules, then that big blob could simulate within itself a lot of these different smaller modules. Whereas we humans have great trouble kind of putting all our little pieces together, if, if that seems useful. We can't really just meld into one big blob. I love so the way I think that yeah. the, uh, the big AI would have the, cap- the opportunity, uh, w- to whatever extent it seemed useful, to subdivide its big mind into smaller minds, uh, if, if that helped solve various kinds of problems. But, I mean, we do have the ability to meld into one big blob. I mean, that's what nations are, that's what armies are, and specifically there's an emotion called transcendence, which allows people to be lifted up into a single collective intelligence and then act and, you know, attack a threat, very much like a swarm of bees. Um, so, I, I mean, I just think the, the, the larger question is, 
is our social intelligence, are our emotions, are they a bug or are they a feature? And the tendency of the Enlightenment is to think that emotions are sort of this inconvenient bug that gets in the way of rationality and critical thinking and all of that sort of stuff. And you'll hear people like Richard Dawkins, you know, they think that even though that 99% of the world is religious, that that's a bug. And the, the, the interesting thing that's coming out of a lot of this evolutionary biology is to say, well, when it happens that often, it actually turns out to be a feature. Um, and, you know, it's partly the chaos of the capitalist market that allows it to be so innovative. And I think that's the interesting thing is, are we, is it, is, is, is the solution to having super intelligence, you know, having a massively ordered system or is it allowing for chaos and then allowing the best solution to emerge? I mean, what, what is a bug uh, or a feature in one system might not be the same as what is a bug or a feature in another system. So um, all this adaptation to uh, social life is uh, a feature if, if you're actually a small person living in a social context with a lot of similar people. Um, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a helpful feature if the alternative would be to have a monolithic AI architecture. Um, I think the other part there is the motivation, like some of these you mentioned, efforts to try to get different humans lined up. It's not just the communication barrier, the difficulty of sharing ideas, which <clears throat> uh, is very uh, time consuming and limited. I know as an author, I kind of have a keen awareness of how slow and inefficient. Uh, linguistic communication is <laughs> but then with humans we have the additional problem of uh, uh, wanting different things so we are actually working positively at cross purposes to one another mm -hmm. one group of human is trying to defeat and destroy what another group of human is trying to create and build up right. um, so uh, sometimes the whole is less than the sum of its parts there's no particular reason to, to think that the uh, global social architecture that we humans have now in the year 2016 is anywhere close to the optimal, even for what we humans could achieve, let alone for a sort of an arbitrarily architectured, uh, intelligent system. Yeah. Professor, we, we uh, are, I'm sorry. I have to run off in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes, I'm afraid. Okay, but, but um, w one of the things that, you know, when you look at our nuclear arsenal, we already have and have had for many years the ability to destroy the globe. Uh, five times over. Uh, do you think that AI will be um, safeguarded in the same way? I know that's kind of what you're calling for to an extent. It's going to be much harder because these are not physical missiles. But to an extent, th th we, we do, human beings are pretty good at not at making sure, even with all their differences, that they don't eradicate themselves completely. What do you think of that? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, uh uh, I agree that we are very good at it. I mean, we haven't yet annihilated ourselves. Yeah. Mm. I think that's about as much as as I would grant in that direction, I think. Um, we've come, I mean, we haven't had a means to do it yet, basically. And um, the closest we had to a means of doing that was our thermonuclear weapons, which we came close enough to fire several times during the Cold War, just in a few decades yes, that we've had true. them. So, that's very true. We, came, um, we had some close hmm. calls. We had definitely had some close calls. Do, do you think, though, that... Um, do you, do you, in writing this book and thinking about this stuff as a philosophy, as a philosopher, and d did this make you, in some ways, more religious, less religious? Uh, you know, I mean, d do you ever wonder what the whole point of this? It's almost like do you find yourself reading the Book of Revelations and going, maybe there was some truth to this. Um, yeah, I mean, so I thought about some of these things before writing the book, but I guess on the margin, uh, probably more. I mean, just. Uh, you realize that there is quite possibly a lot more in, in, in heaven and on earth than is dreamt of in our philosophy, like how small we current humans are in this big scheme of things mm. in different dimensions. And so it just makes one perhaps a little bit more humble about extrapolating from our current limited set of experiences to the entire world, past, present, future, different dimensions, different levels of simulated reality, etc. It just makes one feel kind of small. Yeah, no, no doubt. That's what the book does, and does very well. And it's a great book. Um, so, uh, well, congratulations on 
it's such an ambitious effort and you've obviously been very successful and and the book raises all kinds of incredible questions uh and so uh, we appreciate you taking the time i know you have to go but uh bravo it's a brave book to write it really is and it's ambitious okay. and and it's uh it's it's rare that you see somebody who says who takes on a task like this. You know, I, I more power to you. I, it sounds like it's going to be a question you're going to be answering and wrestling with for many years to come. That seems likely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you. Then. We need you, though. We need people like you to kind of um, pull back the rug and look at all these things. Before you go, in the next ten years, can you give us a peek into what you expect from artificial intelligence and the good things we have to look forward to besides self-driving cars? Um, well, I think that at the moment there is rapid advances in perceptual intelligence, so the ability to recognize the content of images and videos, to recognize speech. Um, so I think that will be rolled out into different kinds of products mm. and used to create better recommender systems, let us say, so that you can actually find more efficiently the, the people, uh, the, the movies, the products that, that will be good for you. Um, that's already happening, but I think there will be more of that. Mm. Um, I'm not allowed to mention the self-driving car since you excluded that from the list of possible <laughs> impacts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, one big... Yeah, I, I th it, it's a kind of a general purpose technology. So there are a lot of things, and I think from healthcare uh, diagnostics to um, scientific research, finding new drugs, entertainment, virtual reality things, transportation. Um, there is hardly any sector that where, where things couldn't be improved and done better by the application of smart software and artificial intelligence. So I think we will see a kind of diffused impact throughout the economy over the next 10 years. Great. Well, Professor Nick Bostrom, the book is Superintelligence Professor of Philosophy at Oxford University. God, I'd love to be a professor of philosophy at Oxford. <laughs> Brian. Um, I would wear tweed jackets. I'd have a German shepherd by my side. Uh -huh. You're probably tall. You're probably just a tall Swede. But anyway, uh, with a big brain. Sir, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence and your brain. We appreciate it. All right. Toodles. Bye-bye. Toodles. I Toodles. Like you get to say that when you're an Oxford University <laughs> professor. <laughs> Take care, sir. Bye-bye. <laughs> um, Brian, I think you'd be a great professor. Do you think we could get the listeners to endow a chair for you? Uh, the first thing I'd do is I'd be like, listen, all the guys, <laughs> get the fuck out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, but... again, though, it's it's funny how you... you, you, you the science, everybody who it's very difficult to quantify what a human being is it just is and we i don't think we've come close yet i, I mean we're getting we're scratching the surface but the and even in the book he says you know the singularity or whatever you want to call it, it may not happen even in this century we got a ways to go well we don't know how long we have to go but i, the, I, th I think the thing that's dangerous is you know the the sort of the blind optimism of the kurzweil camp yeah, I do too, and I think that's why you need guys like Nick Bostrom. Yeah, know? there's no question. But um, d d you know, d d Ray Kurzweil is so optimistic. I mean, the idea that you're, you know, I mean, he's literally ambitious enough to say, "I, I believe that we can live forever." Yeah, but and that's what he wants to believe. I think that's the point that yeah. he wants to believe that, and that doesn't really tell you anything about reality. It tells you about his desires. Well, it's also the idea that, for example, I'm the same without my body. What are you talking about? I am my body. I mean, yeah. that's a huge part of the fact that I am everything. I was talking about being funny. I mean, I'm funny because I, uh, I. It's basically a long wail. It's a wail, <laughs> a lament. <laughs> Uh, for the fact that I'm not who I want to be, I never will be, and someday I'm going to be fucking not. I will not be. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a that's who I am. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you were to say, hey Brian, you're going to live forever, and oh by the way, you don't need your your body. Oh, and by the way, I'll be able to download information into you, so you can be a concert pianist uh, in a couple of minutes. What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? That's the farthest thing from being a human being I can think of. But it, also, all joy goes away. The, 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 I mean, the, the the whole idea of accomplishment is that it's really hard, and that I'll never be close to perfect. But some days I have I I look great on a tennis court, <laughs> and in my mind I'm I'm playing close to Federer. And in other days I'm a spaz, and you know I I my ankles hurt. It, it just. <laughs> Come on, man.
I, I am fascinated by the idea of an AI whose ankles hurt, even though that doesn't have a body. That's right. So am I. <laughs> so am I. It goes back to grief. It yeah. goes back to joy. Yeah. You know, it goes back to all those. It goes back to having grief slash joy. Right. And the fact, I mean, I think that's the thing. You know, death drives people to be creative and to try things and to, you know, insecurities, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know. It does. Why would you play the? Why would you learn how to play the violin just to make beautiful music? I mean, Kurzweil writes all those books and is advocating all of this stuff precisely because he's afraid to die. Uh, he takes one thousand pills a day. Yeah, <laughs> because pill, he's afraid. His pill regimen is something insane. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen how much it costs? It's no, like how much? Hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Yeah, yeah, just to just to just to afford the pills he takes. Well, I, I, and it, also, like, what's his breakfast? It was literally breakfast? something like, it was almost $1.2 million. I can't remember what the exact amount was, but Kurzweil's pill regimen is so ridiculously expensive. Wow. His breakfast? Oh, Ray Kurzweil's it. immortality diet. Let's see. I love uh, it. So, his, this is his breakfast. Berries, dark chocolate infused with espresso, smoked salmon and mackerel, vanilla soy milk, stevia, porridge and green tea he I takes, basically did I take that oh he takes 100 pills a day down from 250 a few years ago it's got to be processed uh, by his liver allegedly thanks to advances in technology um, yeah pretty amazing 100 pills a day 100 pills a day yeah he used to have to take 250 how long do you think it takes you to swallow 250 pills uh, I don't, I'm not going to live that long, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Do you think some of them, and that's the thing I wonder, like some of them are probably like horse pills. They're huge. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. That's, that's pretty terrifying. I mean, the guy is very smart and he probably knows a lot more than I do about health and I'm not probably, he definitely does. Yeah. But, but, um, it's a little bit like I'm writing this joke about being on being on uh, I'd read this many articles as I do about the evils of sugar <laughs> and I'm sitting next to this woman who eats she had two cookies and I was judging her <laughs> And I was like, you would eat two cookies on a plane. Oh, no, thank you. I'll stay very empty. My pancreas is taking a rest. I, I plan on living longer than, than cookie girl over here. And then and I was like, and then 20 minutes later, she took a nap. And I went, ah, you needed a nap. You needed a nap. I'm wide awake. But I guess you had a crash, loser. And, and, I, and I, I could barely look at it. And then I realized I'm, I'm annoyed at somebody because they ate two cookies and took a nap. <laughs> fuck is wrong when they talk about being a crank no, you know, but and I want to apply my knowledge to the whole world because if the world knew what I knew but, they'd be healthy but what that's, a joke that's religion and that's of the course point it is. And that's we're what, all religious and that's the thing and that's what Kurzweil is he has a weird religion but it's just that instead of popping one piece of bread in your mouth you have to pop a hundred pills in your mouth I'm, every day I'm, an, I'm, I'm the a-hole I'm just as bad as anybody I criticize I'm on a, I'm on a plane again woman's reading a guy Gossip rag, yeah. and I'm reading Cormac McCarthy or or Nick Bostrom's book or yeah. whatever, and I'm I'm awesome because I I live in the real world. I'm working mm. with real ideas. I'm this one over here to my right is part of the problem, not this guy. Mm -hmm. This guy's I'm taking on the mantle of knowledge. I I I I I know that one cannot escape the responsibility of being a human being. I've read Seneca for God's <laughs> sake. Meanwhile, she has a couple cookies, and I'm like, yeah, whatever, cookie girl. Can't wait to you. Take a nap. She didn't take a nap. I ended up taking a nap. Oh, I was like, damn it. But I read that the human brain needs a nap. So this because, one's going to stay yeah. awake. I'm going to ungunk my brain and take a nap and live longer. That's right. So now I'm annoyed at her for not taking a nap. <laughs> then there's a woman who's sick in the back of the plane. She goes, I'm an ER nurse. I can help. I went, You're an ER nurse? Yeah. She saves lives. She lives real so life. So now you're I mean, lesser. I'm a piece of shit. Yeah. Look, at the end of the day, I'm learning it to get old as I get older. Not to think that what I know would benefit all of humanity. but Except that it would. Well, Secretly, <laughs> you know that it would. I think if I were emperor of the world, I would do a couple of things. I would um, figure out a way to stay completely out of everybody's lives. Oh. And I would have – I think you need security and law and order. That doesn't mean I would advocate gun control. I would just – maybe I'd let everybody carry a gun. I would just have maximum freedom, but you need <laughs> laws. And uh, and I think I would um, I would kill uh, con men. I don't like con men. I hate oh. con men. Yeah, and so I you would kill, kill them. them. I wouldn't kill them. I'd just put them in uh, sweatshops and they'd have to work. Can I ask you a dangerous question though? Yeah. 
So the a lot of people who have had you know ideas that have changed the world have first been viewed as con men. Shit. So how do you have innovation if you don't allow for con men? Well, you'd be my you'd be my chief of staff. <laughs> oh, that's good. So it'd be my job to sort it out. Yeah, because I, I I tend to fly off the handle and you'd bring me back. Yeah. And ultimately we'd end up doing nothing. We'd just be debating. We would have <laughs> we would have we'd have this podcast and hope people listen to it. And if people I know people they they even though I was the emperor of the world they'd be like you I'm not just listening podcast. to that a hole. <laughs> <laughs> you really wonder what you would do with a lot of power. Right. I would. I would try. At, I hope at forty nine years old, I would have learned my lesson not to do almost anything. M- you know? Yeah, but I don't think that is the solution. I think the the you know it's you you need. I think that's what in general a lot of these guys don't understand the sort of the just the children of the enlightenment. Like mm. you need chaos. You need chaos in order to have innovation and to have really progress do. and all of that stuff. But then you have to create boundaries for that chaos. We don't want that chaos to turn violent. So you remove the possibility of violence from the equation, right? Yeah, or at least the violence is uh, simulated violence, yeah. right? So UFC, fighting, boxing, sure. and all that, yeah. But you're right. I mean, uh, bombs going off in marketplaces and children dying is not, not helpful. It's not helpful. A helpful chaos. You've got to figure out a way to vaccinate your population. That's right. You, you've got to figure out a way to fight bad ideas like anti-vaccination or, yeah. you know, uh, whatever, or uh, antibiotics are the devil, you know, whatever it is. There, there's got to be ways to, you, you're always going to have to fight waves of ignorance yeah. with information, though. Mm-hmm. You know. But also, I mean, that's part of the, the problem of having, you know, scientists who don't value social intelligence. Because they don't know how to get their message out there. No. Yeah. And the people who do value social intelligence are really good at getting their message out there. Did you see this? Uh, Joe Rogan posted a thing about some preacher in Africa who said that he went up to heaven and took a photo of it with his Galaxy Samsung. Sure did see that. <laughs> I sure did. And then he denied it, but uh, because yeah. you know he would never be so disrespectful to Jesus as to bring his cell phone to heaven. <laughs> I know. I know. But anyway, I, I think you know Brian. I think you'd be a great. That's uh, good to reception though to get reception up in heaven. Uh, no, I mean amazing. Well, you think I'd be a great emperor? I think you'd be a great emperor because I think fundamentally you would do what none of these other people would do, which is listen. No, I just have sex a lot. And, and yeah. I, my wife would have to understand because I'm the emperor. <laughs> right. And she'd have everything she wanted, but I'd be like, listen, yeah. don't be a baby about stuff. Yeah. But would you allow her to have affairs? Uh, only if I could videotape it. And, oh, you would, uh, so you would be a lot, you would allow that. I mean, I, I, you know, I hate a hypocrite. So I, I, I think I'd have to allow it. I mean, I, yeah, but they'd have to be very, they'd have to have very small <laughs> penises and, and be very short and not muscular at all. Uh, just because I'm sexually competitive. Uh, understandably, uh, yeah. understandably and reasonably yeah. so. Yeah. Um, yeah, you wonder. You know, uh, you know what um, uh, the Emperor Augustus's wife used to do, right? No. She had a very, very simple strategy. She had as many fares as she wanted, but she made sure that she never, you know, went to sea unless the boat was already fully loaded. So she would only have an affair when she was pregnant. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. She's pretty smart. I was, when I was a young man, I met a girl and I had a little affair with her Mm. and in her, as in, as in I met her and I write in her hotel room and she had a pregnant friend who was like four months pregnant and it was made clear to me that El Prego wanted to have <laughs> sex with me as well. Yeah. And I just, I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing that, man. Really? Yeah, I just, I didn't know whose baby it was. I, I just didn't know if she was with a guy. And also, I just didn't want to. Wow. I had this other girl. I'm sure that made the pregnant they one feel Chicago, great. They were from Chicago, and they had heavy Chicago accents. Yeah. They were talking, you know, and she said, you're cock. She, just, yeah. she referred to me. Anyway, sorry, guys. So what if she we, had- We just had Nick Bostrom on, now I'm talking about this stuff. <laughs> I don't know why. Anyway. <laughs> well, but it sort of goes back to the point is, is that- do uh, being, you, a, being yeah. the emperor. Yeah, but also do you need- Well, A, I think that's the, that's the interesting thing, right? A lot of this stuff is predicated on the idea that you want an AI that is essentially an emperor, an all-powerful, right, single massive intelligence. Well, no, that, that's the problem is that, you know, I feel like politically you've got one side like Nick, you know, Ted Cruz and people like Michael Malice, who we love, and who say there should be no government, really, right. or very little. And then you have Hillary Clinton and especially Bernie Sanders, who's not a socialist communist. He wants to tax people 90% of their 
their income, you know, in some instances. Um, th- so, so Bernie Sanders is not a very, in my opinion, smart guy. Bernie Sanders just has one idea. Let's take from the rich and redistribute wealth. Well, okay. And then I, I suppose I can mount a bunch of historical arguments for why that doesn't work. And he would have his rebuttals and we'd get nowhere. Uh, he would probably laugh and I would, you know, and, and then something would happen, but nothing would happen. So, um, I'm never going to change Bernie Sanders' mind, and I'm and and I'm not going to change young people's minds either necessarily, because the idea of free college and healthcare is a right and housing is a right. But great, I agree with all that. Who's going to pay for it, and and are uh, what kind of a uh, central enforcement agency are you going to have to make sure that that all happens? But see, I think the, the great thing that is built into all of this yeah. is that you have to win these people over to your ideas. Well, right? or Michael Malice had it right, which was maybe both sides are working on an outdated model. Oh, they are. There's yeah. no doubt that they are. But the but I mean, even Bernie Sanders has admitted he doesn't know how he would do all these things. Well, and I mean, a lot of this comes back to like what Bostrom is talking about, which is the reality is, is that manual labor no longer, increasingly, no longer has any value. Like you can't sell your manual labor anymore. That's right. It incre- it's going to have, you know, you unless you unless you massage <laughs> and give release. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, not that, there I, you go. not that I do. But that. wait a minute, Brian. So are you saying? But seriously, like manual is this, labor is sexually... this your job creation platform? That you... <laughs> well, I, I think that I think that there will always be room for. You know, release prostitution. the oldest job in the world. Yeah, and the, the, I mean, the, the, you know, manufacturing is is going by way of automation, <laughs> but there's no robot that's going to take place take the place of. W- w- you wouldn't you wouldn't get released from a robot. I prefer somebody in high heels with low self esteem <laughs> and daddy issues as I get older. <laughs> but so I hope that, my wife Brian, doesn't listen to this shit. But, She's kill but me. Brian, well, I mean, that's the thing. You just hope that she like tunes out as soon as Nick well, Bostrom I, gets. My off. wife has very high self esteem, but it doesn't mean I can't put her in high heels and make her call me daddy. That's that's right. Yeah. That's right. As she and as roll, the as she emperor rolls her of the eyes, world. As she rolls her eyes. <laughs> but listen. <laughs> so, tell, me, tell me you don't like yourself. <laughs> tell me. I know, I, know, I know you do. I know you do. But just say it. Say it. Say it. <laughs> but Brian, this is actually, I mean, you. this is brilliant. You found the one job that, you know, can't be automated. I agree. Yes. Yeah. And so right. the, so Until the, the Japanese come up with some of those crazy robots. Sex robot. But yeah. even then, you can't simulate. It's not going to be the same. People aren't going to want that. I won't. No, and so what you're de- what you're dealing with is is that Brian's plan for the future is is that all all traditional jobs will be done by robots, and then also because you can't export that job, right? Mm. Like you can't outsource that job. I don't want like a video link yeah. massage with release. I want like the no. real deal, of course. So you know you're gonna make America great again I, I by, sure <laughs> by sex workers. I sure am. <laughs> Everyone will the be the idea a sex that sex worker. work is illegal is outrageous. Uh, that's that's really. I mean, I that's know it what exploits we the women. Blah blah blah. No, but I mean, well, have male sex workers is you have more and more you know p- powerful female CEOs. You of know course. they may want male sex workers. Of course they do. You'd be a great sex worker. Women, I know a lot of women. Women, the more I know, plenty of wealthy and powerful women that are shameless and God yeah. bless them. God bless them. So yeah, please. I think that's, uh, Brian, this is, this is really brilliant. Thank you've, you, buddy. You've really, you've Well, solved... that's what this, this show is about cracking the case. <laughs> it's about solving the big problems. You, that's the thing. You've really, you've engaged with the problem, which is, you know, automation and, you know, rather than just dredging up socialism or mm-hmm. whatever the hell mm-hmm. Trump mm-hmm. believes, you yep. know, you're like sex work. That's well, the answer. I feel like a lot of times we're <laughs> over here talking Everybody's talking about how to solve problems or we're talking about the problem when the black swan is there's going to be something come there's something some invention, some AI, some something that's going to come along and just rearrange the entire equation and the board. It already so, is. Yeah. So all of a sudden we've been talking over here and wait, I mean, what the hell is this? You know, plenty yeah. of people had pro- had plans went until World War One came along right. and then World War Two came along and yeah, so... But you can't... I mean, you know, it's Einstein's old thing. You can't uh, solve... Uh, you can't solve problems with the same way of thinking that created them. That's a great quote. Yeah. And that's probably very true. And the, 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 all, of, all of the political candidates are basically dusting off old ways of thinking. And they just don't apply. They're not relevant. They don't, you know. Um, I think it's interesting, too, because as somebody who was force-fed the Reagan doctrine... Mm. As a kid, you mean the truth. I have an yeah. I have an emotional <laughs> attachment to all things, you know, 
Reagan and small government because I love my father and mm -hmm. I think my father's a very fair minded man and a good man and very smart and has worked very hard at, at developing a philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I admire that. So of course there's a part of me that wants to be like that, but, I, but look, I mean, I was listening to Alec Baldwin's podcast. Here's the thing. And he had, uh, I think the chairman, uh, the coalition for the homeless, she was a chairman and, and she was a, an Irish gal from, I think New York. And, and you know, she said something interesting. She said, look, <clears throat> housing is a right. There are people <laughs> who are, um, for a lot of reasons, maybe it's because they have an alcohol abuse problem. Maybe it's because they have mental health issues. They can't take care of themselves. They mm -hmm. can't. They are just on the street. And if you don't believe me, go take a look at Skid Row. Mm -hmm. You know, say whatever you will. The fact is that there are, there are people that become wretches. And I'm, I thought to myself, I mean, I'm so lucky for no reason. Mm -hmm. I had great parents. I had good biology. I don't suffer from mental illness. Um, I don't have a need to drink. I did just lucky, 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 lucky. I don't care what I, I had nothing to do with fucking self-discipline or I can't stand that talk anymore. Uh, so I, of course, I believe in self-reliance and personal responsibility, and I can wax poetic about what makes this country great and, and talk about Thomas Jefferson and freedom. But, you know, I don't want to live in a society that um, has people who can't take care of themselves fighting on the street, dirty, uh, shamed, uh, forsaken, and forgotten. I yeah. don't want to live in that world. So I really appreciate these quote unquote liberals like this woman or Alec Baldwin who are saying, um, yeah, I, I, I like freedom too, but I don't like this. The, the, you know, this woman's brother committed suicide mm -hmm. when he was a young guy. So she has a very different reality and a very deep understanding probably emotionally of what it means to be helpless, how, how, how hard it is to help somebody who mm -hmm. has mental illness and how hard it is for them to help themselves. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, as I get older, I, I find myself <clears throat> really questioning everything that I've, um, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe in socialism and I don't believe in, you know, the state should come in. And, but, you know, sometimes what is the alternative? Right. What is the alternative besides figuring out a way to create free housing for our less fortunate? And, I and think families, 25,000 kids are homeless in New York City. Right. Uh, what are you going to do about that? Well, and I think part of it, too, is in terms of, like, it says something about humanity. Like, it is a need for humanity to not see people suffering, mm. right? Like me, that's, For me, for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's I what I'm saying. I don't like anything about my life when I think of people, like, I think of those Syrian refugees. Right. I, it, it, it really, I have, I, have, I have a Tesla. Yeah. I get in my Tesla and I go to my awesome house in Calabasas. I don't, I, I feed my children... Uh, my wife gets to ride horses. Mm -hmm. I actually don't like that feeling sometimes. Right. I, I, I feel like a pig. But the, but the point is, is that it, <clears throat> it requires wisdom to be able to fix that system without just throwing money at the problem. That's right. And so the, the, it's, That's right. We, the, the goal, I mean, I think all of the goals are good, right? We want an economy that is innovative, that is competitive, that creates great things. We also don't want homeless people on the streets, you know, people who can't take care of themselves. We want to afford as much. I mean, human dignity is a valuable commodity, and it is one that we should, you know, try and raise anywhere we can. Yeah. And then the question is, and you have to include all perspectives and listen to as many people as possible to try and figure out how do you solve that problem? How do you create a system that, you know, satisfies the desires of, you know, let's call them Reaganites and, you know, that satisfies the desire of libtards, right? Well, you know, Michael Malice comes, it falls in the middle with religion, right? He's, that's why he's very hesitant to criticize religious people because mm -hmm. churches and synagogues and mosques and, you know, do a lot. They yeah. do a lot to help people that can't help themselves. I'm not. I'm too right. busy. I'm too busy making money mm -hmm. or, you know, I don't know, writing or whatever, raising my own kids. I don't yeah. have time. I mean, I wish I did, but I'm shamed by the fact that I don't do enough. I give. I have a couple of charities I give, I don't know, 40 bucks a month to. Yeah. Please, please. I drank a lot of wine last night. My, <laughs> my bill was hard to look at. I'm swollen in the face. <laughs> no, that's not true. 
Well, Brian, your I'm, face looks amazing. I'm right a good now. looking guy. Yeah. The most important thing is that I retain my looks. Yeah, it really. I mean, I, 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 I you know, you asked Nick Bostrom about how he feels about you know God, and yeah. I, when I look at your face, I feel like there probably is one. Is it the symmetry? <laughs> it is the symmetry. You know. Will you help me with an audition? Yeah, I would be honored to. Oh, good. Are we going to do it on the podcast? Probably not, because we only have five <laughs> minutes left, and we should probably wrap this up. Um, I'll get a jump start on it. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Brian the Kid Callan and and uh, my colleague, the man who's much smarter than I am and <laughs> seems to be able to remember everything, including names, Hunter, Tailpiece, Mots. <laughs> <clears throat> and when I say Tailpiece, he's got an ass on him. Yeah. It's a big Dutch ass. Strong mm. ass, though. He's built for the farm. Not mm. the battlefield. He doesn't have the temperament. He's built for the that farm. That is probably true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're, you're a member of, is it, are you in, the, are, you, are you people the tallest race in the world? Yeah, that is true. That yeah. is true. Even taller than the, 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 the Maasai and the Sudanese? Oh, I don't know. I'm na- the tallest nationality, but I don't know if you're talking about specific ethnic groups. Yeah. Because those Sudanese guys. They're tall. <laughs> they're, hey guys, they're tall. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yo, they're tall. Yo, those guys is tall. Um, Brian, how would you feel if when your emperor, your wife had a Sudanese lover? Would It'd be f- tough. It, um, because, I mean, cause because the, I'm territorial. Tall. Well, he's been easy. He'll, he'll hit places I, have. yeah, I, I, you haven't I can't reach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's a problem for me. So I would probably, I'd have to beat her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am the emperor. I know domestic would violence. You, is... Would you? Would you beat her, or would you have your Praetorian guard beat her for you? Well, I, I would probably do it with, um, like a, I don't know, like like flowers. I would just. I would, oh, you would beat I would her, pelt with her with rose petals. Oh wow, that would really show her. I'm going to show you, and then throw really expensive rose petals and silk at her. <laughs> I'm going to throw <laughs> silk and rose petals at you until you can't take it anymore. Until the softness and the luxury makes you realize all that I've given you. That would get really painful after a while. I would you imagine. think so? Silk? Yeah, and I rose mean, petals? anything. You, like, it's like if you took an empty aerosol can and started hitting somebody lightly with it. After a while, it's yeah, going to make a mark. Rose petals. You really think rose petals would? Look, man, I don't have to answer these questions. I'm the emperor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. But I'm kind of fascinated by this, Brian. I mean, I kind of want to just like, can we put you in a room full of rose petals with a fan and After just have while, you be- After a just get to you. you, you know? it, it's well, like I'm sure you'd be annoying, but yeah. it'd be like water torture. Ro- Dub, rose Dub petal Davidoff torture. compares it to swimming with dolphins. Yeah, I like, love that. You're in, you're in the pool. You're like, these dolphins are amazing. But after a half hour, you're like, can somebody give these dolphins a better personality? I saw you jump through a hoop. And you, you feel like an olive, but I could give a shit. I'm cold. I want out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even swimming with dolphins gets old, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. And that is the message for today. Hunter Mott's always stimulating. Thank you. And thank you to Professor Nick Bostrom. And Rena Marie. Oh, and Rena Marie, of course. Yeah. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye. 